Hi, and welcome. Hi, Tanya. Thank you for joining me. Hello, Ine. Hello, everyone who's uh, coming online. Awesome. Guys, it's so good to have you live with us. Today, Dr. Tanya and I are chatting about um, puppy bone growth and development. So I think this is really interesting. Every now and then we have these images circulating the internet or social media, I should say, that um, show these puppy growth plates or the puppy bone development at very, very young ages. Lots of interesting information comes out whenever they circulate. Um, and so I'm really excited to be able to have this conversation and dive into what we're actually looking at. Um, and maybe we can go into some other areas of bone growth and development and what we should and shouldn't be doing with our puppies as well, because that's all a part of the, of the conversation. So if you guys are joining us live, it's so great to have you. We're here to have a conversation with you. So please let us know where you're from uh, and any questions that you have, any comments, please share them, your experiences. We want to hear from you guys. So chat with us and join the conversation. All right. I see there are quite a few of you online. Thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Tanya, will you please introduce yourself and your interest in our topic today, puppy growth and bone development? Great. Thanks, Anae. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, yo, where do I begin? I have been a veterinarian for 30 years this year, um, and I started in small animal practice, and literally around um, the mid-2000s, I developed a really strong interest in um, in physiotherapy or in physical rehabilitation and uh, in 2009 I opened my own practice and I've been working with dogs and cats ever since. I think one of the biggest problems that we see um, in practice certainly where I am are dogs with hip dysplasia and that was where my interest really started with regards to puppies and puppy skeletons because I firmly believe and there, there is some of that information now starting to come out, but I firmly believe that if we work on the soft tissue, then we can positively influence the skeleton. And if we have a hip dysplastic dog with an unstable joint and we can strengthen the surrounding musculature, then I think we can make a difference to the development. And so mm -hmm. that really was my starting point for being so interested in, in skeletons. And the more that I read and the more that I research and the more I I see younger dogs and I'm, I am seeing more of them, the more I believe we certainly can influence any of the patients that we get. And for those of you that aren't rehab um, practitioners and are perhaps just very interested dog parents, you know, pet parents, there is so much that we can do both, both positively and negatively that influences the skeleton. And to have this conversation, really, I think there's so much in it. So thank you to Online Pet Health for for choosing to have this as a discussion. Um, I'm really keen to see what, what transpires for, for the course of today. So that's me. I, I mean, I could talk for a long time. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Hi, everyone from Scotland, Nadia from South Africa, and from Hungary. That's amazing. I think that's a new one for us. It's so great to have all of you with us. I think as Dr. Tanya said, let us know if you are a pet parent or if you're a vet rehabber, because uh, it's really great for us to know who we're speaking to and what your specific interest is as well in today's subject. Um, from Australia, wow, what time is it in Australia at the moment? We never get Australians live with us. It's good to have you, Rachel. Um, all right, so as we get started, let's pull up this image that loves to circulate on social media and let's break it down a little bit. So, Dr. Tanya, can you tell us what we're looking at here um, and kind of what the misconceptions are and what is really happening? Okay, um, yeah, good, uh, good starting point. So if we start on the left side of the screen at three days old, what, what we're looking at is progressive radiographs of the front limb of a dog. <clears throat> and remember that when we take radiographs, the only thing we see of the thing of the, of the skeleton are those parts of the skeleton that have mineralized. So those parts that have got a calcium deposition that then comes up as the white parts that you see on the radiograph because they will impact those x-rays as they move through and that's how we get our image. So if you look at the one on the left-hand side, which is three days old, 
what we see is a very small humerus um, right sort of in the top top uh, third of the screen we can see a few rib cage a bit of ribs and the and the sternum but i'm more interested in the humerus then we can see radius and ulna so the head of the puppy is towards the left of my screen i don't know if that's coming up um or the same for everyone else but um so the of the two bones we know that the way that it's positioned right now the radius is going to be the one that is cranial and the um, ulna is going to be the one that's caudal on this view yeah so that so that's the ulna and if you move that's the and that's the radius and then we kind of like have a gap of nothing where it looks like all we've got is skin and soft tissue and then we move down and we've got yeah so that's the skin and soft tissue and then we move down and those are the beginning parts of the metatarsals and if you go a little bit more distal to that, you can see the starts of the phalanges. Okay, so the reason we can't actually see them is because the bone is there and the joint is there. But remember that if we're talking about ossification and endochondral ossification, that means that it is the bone is growing from a plate which is primarily cartilage. And when the cartilage ossifies, that's when we start to see the bone. So in that whole gap there around the carpal region, we have got a cartilage hub. So a whole amount. And even if you move further up to where to the elbow area where the humerus meets the radius and ulna, there also we have cartilage from which the bone grows. And if we know how soft cartilage is, I want you to think about how easy it is to adversely impact that soft tissue. Okay, so that's the starting point. If we go to 26 days old, which is then just over three weeks, now you can start to see that those end plates, if you move up to the humerus, and we've got the, yeah, that little bit there. So that's the bit that we saw in the first um a radiograph and if you move just a bit distal to that right there that is now the the end plate or the that's going to become the humeral condyle okay so if i've got the right words i always get mixed up between condyles and epicondyles but anyway and the line between those two is essentially what we end up seeing on the growth plate so now that whole condyle is starting to ossify but at three days old it was only cartilage so if we start to move down towards the carpal region you can start to see that some of those carpal joints are now also beginning to ossify and if you move to 49 i think you can appreciate that that now 49 days that's um seven weeks now we are almost starting to see the patterns that we're accustomed to seeing on radiographs and if we go to 62 days which is two months um that looks more like the radiographs we are accustomed to seeing in puppies for most of us because very few of us will see um, radiographs of the very young skeleton and now we can start to see that now you see your growth plates which we are used to seeing and you can see that all of the bones have started to ossify and now you can identify those individual bones but that doesn't mean that they weren't already beginning to form with three days old and for me this is like the magic when you see them all put together like this and you appreciate what's in those gaps that's what blows my mind and what has made me also think well how much can we really influence the puppy skeleton or the human skeleton but we're talking dogs uh, it is it is absolutely incredible and mind-blowing um, guys, thank you for joining us live. It's so good to see all of you, all the comments coming through. Thank you. Um, so, okay, so half past eight for Rachel and it's half past nine for Dale in Victoria. Wow. <laughs> I love Australia. I have family there, but it's always a time zone thing. It's very interesting. Um, all right, guys. So let's, can, can we look at how these images kind of overlay with the activity level of the puppy because a three-day-old puppy what is it doing a three-day-old puppy yeah great 
so three day old puppy is really just suckling from its mm. from its dam so it's not i mean they're only really going to start to move around and wait bear they start to walk let's say two and a half to three weeks so that's going to mm. be 21 days so when they're when they're suckling at three days old they don't need all of that structure and it can help you to understand um, why they perhaps aren't able to wait bear either because they mm. don't have um, sufficient ossification and sufficient rigidity within the skeleton to be able to hold themselves up. If we move to 26 days, now we've actually got more calcified bone or more ossification. So we're going to have more rigidity or more support for the muscles. And 26 days is when those puppies are starting to amble around. Um, you know, they're, they're a very, very cute stage. Let's say it's about, um, it's about four weeks, not quite. Um, mm -hmm. They're starting to move. And th at this point, for example, they're still going to be with their mother and hopefully they're not going to be with any other large dogs because any la other larger dogs or adult dogs, if they stepped on that, there could be a lot of damage done, particularly at the, well, wherever, wherever that weight bearing may be. Once you get to seven weeks, 49 days, for a lot of us, I cringe, but a lot of puppies leave their homes at seven weeks. Yeah. Um, and now we've got a puppy that is fully weight-bearing and fully able to move. It's ambulatory. It's probably starting to try to run a little bit, and it's all uncoordinated because the nervous development still has to, has to happen mm -hmm. as well. But if you appreciate from three days to seven weeks the change in that limb in terms of the support structure, yeah. um, so you know that's the de the development, and then when you get to two months, um, more more structure. Now, from a neurological and a and a muscular soft tissue development, that puppy is starting to find its coordination. It's starting to mm -hmm. um, want to play more. It's a lot more active, um, and it can be because it's got the 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 um, skeletal support to be able to do that. But that mm -hmm. bone at, at two months is still very, very, very soft, mm -hmm. very soft. So it's not completely mineralized at all. And that total mm -hmm. mineralization process can take between 18 months and, you know, it's only complete by between 18 months and 22 months, depending on the, on the breed. Mm -hmm. So although on a radiograph, the growth plates have closed and everything looks complete, we can still, if we're doing a lot of high impact activity from 12 months to 18 months, we can still have a negative impact on the skeleton. So as you were talking, the, the connection between the activity level and the bone growth, they, they really go hand in hand, right? Because bone remodels and shapes and is stimulated to ossify through movement and through activity. So as the puppy starts to move a little bit more, the bones are stimulated and they ossify a little bit more and it, they kind of go hand in hand together or is would, would the bones ossify even if the puppy wasn't starting to move more and more? You know, that's a really good question and not something I've ever looked for. Okay. Um, I don't think it's necessarily an answer because... Yeah, who, so who I think there... I think there are two components to that. I think the one component is exactly as you said, as they start to move, the you know because everything in our body is a feedback loop. Mm. So as they start to move, we are stimulating more bone growth, more ossification, and we know that from a fracture. You know, we've, we mm. we just need to see callus formation and how the bone remodels with appropriate weight bearing exercise. So it makes sense that you say as these puppies are starting to move and weight bear. The bones developing but i also think and this is just off the top of my head i would have to research it but i also think that there is um, a dna or a genetic encoding for that to happen as well so even if the puppy was paralyzed i mean swimmer puppies don't necessarily move okay if we talk about swimmer syndrome in puppies they are you know spread eagled but the bones are still ossifying. So I think that that they might not be ossifying correctly, but I think that that process that we see here is still happening. Mm. 
Yeah, I think that's an interesting question because if we if we were to take X-rays of the swimmers' puppies, would their development be follow, would their bone development be following the same rate, or would there be a, be a difference? Would it suddenly spike when we start to get them straighter and weight bearing? Um, yeah, I don't think this is an either. You know, I don't think it's an either or thing, and I don't think it's a wrong or right thing. I think that like you said there are feedback loops and one thing will depend on the other and feedback and i i, I love that about the body <laughs> um yeah. all right so questions are all welcome um charlotte asks so manipulation of the joint if the puppy is born with a club foot early it can be manipulated to be normal before ossification takes place um that's an interest that's an interesting question what do we do if we have abnormal confirmation in a very young puppy yeah so it's very interesting I, I i don't have an answer for charlotte i would um but i would certainly say i think it can be influenced but it can be influenced either way so mm -hmm. if i if i just give you an example there is a um there was some research done in japan and i can't remember the author and i can't remember it was i think in the early 2000s where they looked at a medial patella luxation and what so we now we are talking about manipulation because we know that if the patella doesn't actually sit adequately in the groove we don't get sufficient development of that trochlear groove or that femoral groove mm -hmm. so what he looked at was he had um, breeds that were prone to medial patella luxation and he actually I can't remember what technique he used, but at four weeks, he already identified which puppies were going to develop medial patella luxation. And he placed that patella, and then he followed those puppies through. And those puppies ended up with normal development. So in other words, we didn't have to do any further, um, any sort of surgical interventions on those dogs. Wow. So, and I, 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 I could be misquoting him, but I, I do remember that he, he, he started at four weeks. I can't remember all of the, the detail, but he positively influenced the outcome or, or, the, or the presentation of that medial patella luxation. Therefore, yeah. if I had to go and say, well, if it's born with a club foot, can we influence it? Yes, but I think we'd have to understand the biomechanics and what is it that that we were doing to influence it. Mm -hmm. That would be my my answer. I yeah, I, I I like that. And I mean four weeks, four weeks is very young, right? Yep. We would have to have access to these litters at four weeks, which means a very close relationship with the breeders. Um and I do I do think there are vet rehabbers who are doing that, who are forming those really close relationships with breeders so that they can do puppy evaluations from a young age. Um, and that's huge. That has huge potential. I love it. Um, yeah. how, how useful would this be to educate breeders for the health of our dogs? I'm a VP and I'm so interested in preventative physiotherapy. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, you answered the question pretty much, Anne, with, yeah, you know, if we could get access to these puppies, wouldn't that yeah. be wonderful? I mean, yeah. I come back to hip dysplasia because I think it's hugely relevant and it's, and it's prevalent. It's prevalent all over the world. And mm -hmm. because it's a, um, a polygenic condition, we are battling to manage it from a genetic perspective and our breeding stock and the dogs that we're choosing to breed with because phenotypically they're normal mm. they don't have hd but we are still getting hip dysplasia puppies from those crosses so mm. if we were able to catch those puppies at 12 weeks how much could we influence them with regards mm. to proper gluteal activation and proper placement of those legs before that instability becomes um, unmanageable. So I think mm -hmm. your question, Charlotte, is very valid. And, and I think that the research will come. And the more we have talks like this, and the more we question, hopefully, the more we can get, um, we can get the, the funding and the sponsorship to actually do these, pro to actually do the research.
Mm, I agree. Um, and just if we can just start working with breeders, if you can get a few that trust you, that work with you, you're going to learn through that process as well. And you're going to find the areas where we can fill gaps and where we can support them. And I think that's really important. Um, if I think about the horses, I don't know how well this would translate to the dogs, but kinesio tape is incredibly powerful in this young development phase at correcting angular limb deformities. And all you've done is place a strip of kinesio tape in a specific area around the joint. Um, and I think it could be the same thing for dogs if we could apply kinesio tape to tiny puppies. <laughs> uh, all right, hormones. Katie, that's a great question. So how important are hormones in the bone ossification process? And I think that would go further than just these, you know, 62 days. And what, what happens with the change when we neuter or spay um, at six months or later? Yeah, I think um, it's not, it's again, it's not an area of expertise for me, but I think personally, hormones are vitally important. And we are seeing some of that research coming out now, particularly with regards to, um, uh, I can do this, at um, higher incidence or higher risk for cranial cruciate ligament disease mm -hmm. in large breed dogs that are neutered at six months versus neutered at two years. So there's a big Rottweiler study that came out, I think, um, last year. And so what we, what we are seeing is that if we neuter dogs at six months, then the tibial growth plate closes earlier. The proximal tibial growth plate closes earlier than it would normally. And the distal femoral growth plate doesn't. And that creates a more upright stifle, which then increases the risk of cruciate ligament disease in dogs that are neutered and that's that's neutered in terms of male and female with dogs that are yeah. sterilized at six months of age because the skeleton is immature, skeleton is immature yeah i haven't seen yeah. that article but i have seen the one that chris sink and team brought out um in 2023 which looked at the differences between um, sterilization and then vasectomy or ovary, spa ovary sparing spays. I didn't even know we did those. Um, and then intact. And that was one of the things that they brought through is that, um, you know, the risk of, of orthopedic whatever, Alberta spasia, yeah. hip spasia, cruciate ligaments, those all increase with, with early sterilization. Uh, which is interesting, but it isn't just, you know, it isn't just orthopedic conditions that we're looking at. It's cancer, um, reproductive conditions. There's a whole other health concerns, behavior, often neutering and spaying is done for behavioral reasons. So they've, Chris Sink and her team looked at all of those different things and their incidents mm. and then tried to pull conclusions from that. Um, which is really interesting. We can, yeah. I have that, I can share it with you guys. Um, but I, I mean, I've always been an advocate for, you know, spay and you to your dog because <laughs> we live in South Africa. There are no excuses for having puppies. Um, and I think I might be wrong. I, I need to readjust yeah. that perspective, right? That, that's what the data says. I think, you know, perhaps not so much ossification, but just a recap on basic um, biochemistry is that the structures of the sex hormones are very, very similar to that of um, that of a cortisone, which is which is a growth stimulant. So if we don't have testosterone or estrogen or progesterone, then we're not going to get the growth that we need. And if we are removing that source at six months of age then I do think that we are doing our dogs a disservice on every level, not just, mm -hmm. um, not just on the skeletal level, but on the muscular development. It's an androgen. It's, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. it wasn't corticosteroids. It was androgen was the word I was looking for. It's a growth. It, it stimulates growth and strength and development. So mm -hmm. we sterilize them, we're removing that. I have to reshift my whole perspective. <laughs> I've been very judgmental of people that maybe didn't deserve it. <laughs> um, 
All right, so club foot and people can be splinted to influence the foot position. Yes, absolutely. Um, right. But then at, kind of at what age of, de- you know, at which stage of development does that happen? Does it matter? <laughs> that would be my, my kind of question there. And then how do we translate that back towards our puppies? Oh. All right, let's see. Okay, this is great. How would you diagnose a potential hip dysplasia so early at 12 weeks old to do preventative physio? Sure. My favorite topic. So if we backtrack a little, all puppies are born with normal hips. And at eight weeks of age, we can already start to see some loosening of the capital ligament and Mm -hmm. a little bit of laxity in the joint capsule. And this then, as the puppy starts to walk more, and become more active that laxity is then exacerbated so and they're getting heavier so by 12 weeks you have slightly more laxity and don't think in terms of um uh, of ortolani it's not that pronounced by the time you get to a seven month old puppy and you've got a positive ortolani um it's quite easy to to um identify but Mm -hmm. i believe we should be palpating hips in dogs in puppies when they come in for their vaccinations. And I see there's a question about educating G- GP vets. Um, but welcome to my world, hey. they The puppies just come in and they come out and I'm not convinced that all of them get the examination they should have because mm-hmm. it's time. But we should be evaluating those joints. We should be watching how the puppy moves. We should be looking at conformation. Um, and so whilst you might not pick up an overt um, instability, I think you would pick up some areas of pain, particularly if you were uh, checking SIJ, if you were checking um, the muscle structure around there, if you were um, placing some pressure on the dorsal aspect, so almost on the gluteal area, Mm -hmm. I think you pick up pain. I don't see enough puppies, and I'm not in GP practice anymore to really be able to comment, and I've tried to get vets on board to do this, because, Mm -hmm. and then we need to be listening to the trainers, the, the, pet, the pet parents, all the people that are working with these puppies and going, your puppy's sitting funny. Why is your puppy not um, as active as I would expect it to be, etc. And we should be, as the veterinary profession, I feel we need to not be as, um, I've got to be very careful how I say this, but we think that we have all the knowledge, but there is so much knowledge everywhere within our field and Mm -hmm. and we need to start incorporating that within our practices whatever it might be because Mm -hmm. it is not possible for me as a vet to know everything and you won't see everything either right it just there's no way you'll see everything that that puppy's presenting i think you hit the nail on the head by saying let's involve the trainers in kind of recognizing those signs because a puppy that doesn't jump is weird. Puppies jump, right? So if it's not jumping, why not? And if they're not, if they're sitting funny, why are they doing that? So just because it, I don't, I don't think I've ever palpated a puppy, even my own, where I've been able to say, "Whoa, this is sore," because they're just they're too wiggly they and they wriggle and they're like everything is. I just want to lick you. I'm like, I don't know what you're telling me, <laughs> but they don't jump if they have Mm. hip dysplasia or not as much as you would expect. Right. So I think those are, those are the things and the trainer will pick up on that. And if the puppy is in like a six week socialization class, then educating the owner on those signs can be a part of that class. It should be a part of that class. Is Mm. your puppy behaving normally for its breed? What should you be looking for? And if you are seeing these things, what do you do? And, and I think from a professional's perspective, we shouldn't be dismissive. If someone comes to us and says, hey, 100%. my puppy's not jumping, but why is it not jumping? Um, or And when I say jumping, I mean, you know, you come in the door and they go, hey, mommy. <laughs> That's normal, right? So I think um, there's so much scope for us to develop strong teams within Mm. different professions, interdisciplinary professions, where we can fill these gaps, create education, and find 
things like hip dysplasia early. Very, yeah. very possible. I think so. Yeah. I'd like to add something there because the question was at 12 weeks. But if, mm -hmm. if the GP vets are um, seeing this puppy through a series of vaccinations, there's a good chance they're seeing them at six or eight weeks. They're seeing them at 10 to 12 weeks. They're seeing them again at 14 to 16 weeks. And if a joint and skeletal evaluation becomes part of our normal practice, we will start to pick up, oh, normal, 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 normal. Oh, this one feels a little bit strange. And so mm -hmm. it's the same as what we do in rehab. You know, in the beginning, it's really perhaps hard for you to figure out, I mean, I, this is going to sound ridiculous, but I, I'm not sure I'm feeling a trigger point. And mm -hmm. then the more you feel and the more you have a mentor and the more somebody shows you this is a trigger point, the more you go, oh, okay. And eventually you're so blasé about it. It's just, yeah. why doesn't everybody know how to palpate a trigger point? And so for me, I think that if we have, if we're able to, if vets are able to do that with the mm. all the puppies that come through, large breed, small breed, doesn't matter. We mm. will establish what is normal. Mm. I agree. I agree. And it doesn't take so much longer to spend no. five minutes, 10, 10 minutes max, just feeling through and doing a quick ortho eval on a puppy. Um, yeah, I love that. I love that. Yeah. I think in one of Leslie Ead's lectures, she speaks about exactly that and how that process can be incorporated into the puppy. Um, yeah, early evaluations and assessments. I think that's really important. So let's shift back to cruciate ligaments because we know that hip dysplasia has a big genetic component. Do we have that same link in cruciate disease or do we not know yet? We don't know yet. Mm. But um, there are studies there are studies in the process and some that are, you know, hopefully going to be published soon. But mm -hmm. I think they are trying to identify what is the uh, with my my instinct tells me there's a genetic component. Mm -hmm. But yeah. um, we don't have the research yet. Not yet. Yeah, no. I think cruciate, cruciate ruptures are one of the most interesting things to me because I think there is something we're missing i think there's a um, biomechanical link that we're missing because mm. we're not looking for it um but i don't know <laughs> yeah, so um, i mean if we back if we just backtrack a little if you think about a steep tibial plateau angle mm -hmm. that will have a genetic component yes but yeah. if we're talking about degeneration of the cruciate ligament itself which we think is now this is now beginning to be accepted as the cause. It's a chronic wear and tear degenerative condition as opposed to acutely traumatic. Mm. Then we don't have the information with regards to genetics pertaining to that. Mm. So what else could be causing that degeneration would be the yeah. question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's see. So human HD and the conclusion was in humans, it's largely due to not enough room in the uterus that's restricting normal development. Um, would this relate to dogs too? Um, you know, from a hip dysplasia perspective, we do know that it's not only the genetics that produces mm. the, the phenotype or the expression of the, of the genes, it's the environment as well. And so I would my I would also go yeah yeah why not, and particularly mm. if you think we're dealing with large breed dogs which usually have large litters, which means that there's less space in the uterus, then perhaps perhaps your reasoning is sound and it and it does have it does play a role. I mean I don't discount anything. <laughs> I think everything's got to be examined <laughs> and questioned. <laughs> and questions exactly. I love that. Uh, okay, when I do assessments on dogs with elbow dysplasia, I often find hind limb weakness. Maybe possible hip dysplasia. So my thoughts are, if we manage the hip dysplasia early, do you think it will reduce the occurrence of elbow dysplasia? A very interesting question. Sure. I think that it won't reduce the occurrence of elbow dysplasia because that's a separate set of genes. But I do think that it will, um, it will impact on the intensity of the of the 
of the physical symptoms. Because if we've got a, um, a dog with hindquarter weakness, it is by virtue of that weakness, weight shifting mm -hmm. to the front, which is overloading the elbows. If those elbows have a elbow dysplastic te tendency or genetics, it's just going to intensify the problem. But, mm -hmm. but even if that dog didn't have a back limb problem, the elbow dysplasia would still be there. I don't know if I'm really making sense, but I'm, ju I'm just, it's got a genetic, elbow dysplasia has a genetic component. It's there or it's not there. Hip dysplasia has a genetic component. It's there or it's not there. And the way that we um, environmentally impact those dogs will impact the expression of it, mm -hmm. but it won't stop it from happening. Mm -hmm. But we know how responsive hip dysplasia is is to management elbow yes. dysplasia less so so it, yeah, elbows, it makes mm. to get ahead of it yeah, yeah. yes um, certainly <laughs> so back to the hips let's talk about early diagno diagnostics um teg is asking about the pup scan hip ultrasound done at eight weeks old i'm not familiar with that. <laughs> done in south africa no, <laughs> no okay. i'm not familiar with it either so you know i've got some research to do after this chat i'm sorry okay. Tig, i can't comment yeah. um what about the other diagnostic procedures that we have so pen hip that's looking at that distraction index at what age do, can we do that um what other tests can we use so, so pen hip has been um, evaluated and um, verified for puppies at 16 weeks of age. Okay. So in other words, if they take the pen hip radiographs at 16 weeks and they find a distraction index larger than, I don't know, I can't remember the number, 2.5 or whatever, mm -hmm. then they have correlated that to severe hip osteoarthritis later in life. In other words, the more we can distract it, which means the more lax the hip, yes, that dog is going to get hip dysplasia um, later or osteoarthritis of the hip later in life. Yeah. But All the right. other, you know, so I think as physios or as people doing rehab, we should be focusing on palpation skills and movement. Mm -hmm. Um, as opposed to relying on the diagnostics. And if we are lucky enough to be doing puppy evaluations, then if we've got a red flag, because now our palpation skills, let's be honest, as a rehabber, your palpation skills are phenomenal. So you are going to pick up something. You are going to then hopefully have a number of vets or a vet on your team that you can say, I'm really worried. Please, can you? So we become... As a vet rehabber, we become the primary, we alert at this point while we continue with the education and the different types of scanning and the different diagnostic or imaging process procedures that might be available. I think and that's in my so little... because yeah. we, we can often pick up in the soft tissue that something is wrong long before it's visible on diagnostics. And we need to take that seriously as well because if we do find something and there isn't a diagnosis that can be made at that point in time doesn't mean we didn't find something it just means we found it early <laughs> let's do something about it and i think that's really important so um yeah thank you for that question with the with the hip ultrasounds i i haven't heard of it before either <clears throat> all right Oh, this is interesting. I've been told that a dog that lies with its hind leg straight out at the back or ceiling has good hips. <laughs> is that true or false or who knows? So I think you need to look at whether or not the hips are actually extended. So I've seen some of those dogs where the hips are flexed and then from the stifle uh, distally, those are straight. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. it's completely flat where it's like I would be lying on our back or like if you're taking a hip, um, a pelvic radiograph and everything is extended, I would say that your assumption is false because if we've got enough of an unstable hip and there's no mm -hmm. contact, I mean, I've got 
brachycephalic dogs here with the worst possible hips you can imagine, but there's no contact. And so they've got full extension. In fact, they're hypermobile in those hips because there's no, there's no actual hip joint. Uh, okay. Yeah. So Good. I wouldn't make that assumption. I, I also have to say, That's I, me. Know. I wouldn't make that assumption. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay, no good. Um, Rebecca, can you tell me if you are watching from YouTube? Because I don't think I've ever seen a comment come up from YouTube. So please tell me. Um, I adopted my GSD at eight months and she had been at a shelter so long she's she was gonna be put down. Uh da -da, yeah. So if I had gotten to her two months sooner, I could have done the juvenile surgery. I just knew something was, was wrong with her and it took four doctor visits palpating her before one finally said, oh yes, we need an x-ray of both hips. They're very bad. That shouldn't have taken four visits. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's really difficult, Rebecca, but hip dysplasia is really responsive to management. Um, yeah. It is one of those conditions where we've seen, yes, if you can do the surgery, young, great, but if you can't, take a really proactive management approach, diet, exercise, manage pain, um, and that can be done without non-steroidals for a very long time if you've got all the other pieces in place. Um, so we do, if you need, we do have some resources through Online Pet Health that I can share with you. Um, let me know and I can send those through to you. Okay. Uh, okay. Is pen hip available in South Africa? Is no. it? So no. we, have one, we have one vet that has done the course. He's in Durban. Um, okay. And the problem is that all of the, so everything is... Um, patented and all of the radiographs have to be sent to the USA for grading and it just hasn't been a viable option for South Africa from a cost perspective that's my understanding okay. um, and so so pen hip is the only distraction process that has been validated to my knowledge it's not the only one available so if yeah. you go look at um, dis hip distraction dogs you you will find that there are a few others, but um, we it's it's they, we don't have any vets at the moment that are actually doing pen hip rads, not in South Africa. No. Okay. Good. I didn't I didn't know that. Um, I actually thought uh, Cara Amstutz's webinar this month covers the a little bit about the pen hip, um, and it sounded like you you're certified and then you can do your, the measurements yourself but you need specific tools or something so yep. okay interesting. and then once you've taken the radiographs they have to go to the united states for grading so you can't just take them and then grade them yourself they actually have to go to the states i mean it's much easier now than it was 20 years ago because we've got online stuff you know 20 years ago we were physically courier you know those x-ray plates um things have become simpler Oh, yes. I, I think having online resources, whole new world. <laughs> I love it. Um, thank you for joining us from the UK. And I'm glad you guys are loving this conversation. It's very interesting. So let's hope that vets can start to do muscle and bone assessments early on in the puppy's life. Yes. Are there any resources for routine stretching, massaging and movement exercises that can be done by the puppy owners to reduce risks? Or would this not be recommended? What are your thoughts on that and what puppy owners should be doing and shouldn't be doing with their puppies? And I think this is a huge question because how much activity is too much in a growing puppy? How do they know? How do they regulate that? What kind of training or exercises should or shouldn't pet owner, puppy owners be doing? I think this is a massive topic. Um, can you speak into that a little bit? Sure. I mean, I have a whole course on managing puppy hip dysplasia. And from, from when you, from if you're the breeder, right the way through to the first sort of, I think it's four months of age. So I've got a lot to say. So let me summarize what I can. First of all, I think it's vitally important that we appreciate, if we come back to the beginning of this talk with if you weren't here, 
how soft that skeleton is. And so one of the big components of a dog that um, that brings on the development of hip dysplasia aside from the genetics environmentally is trauma. Mm -hmm. So if we have got pups that are running and jumping and slipping on floors and tumbling and they're playing with dogs that are bigger than themselves and that are older and more developed, remember that your 12 week old puppy is still clumsy. Now it's going to play with a six month old or a one year old who is way more physically capable. They're going to try and do the same things that those dogs are doing, and they're not going to be able to because they don't have the neurological development, they don't have the cohort, they don't have the muscular support, and they're going to fall and they're going to tumble. And the more that that happens, the greater the possibility that the hip dysplasia that is underlying in that dog will develop. So we need to really be speaking to our, our, our puppy parents to say, you've really got to manage this puppy, you know, and you've got to manage its hargy bargy with bigger dogs. One of the things I'm adamant about is no stairs until 12 weeks. Pups do not have the neurological development to manage stairs until they're 12 weeks old. So how, you know, we've all seen those videos on Facebook of the dogs tumbling down the stairs. And I cringe because all of those joints, that soft skeleton is being bumped and traumatized every single tumble. And so we can be telling clients this, so block off the stairs until the puppy is 12 weeks old. When it gets to 12 weeks, put it in a harness and teach it mm -hmm. to walk up the stairs and teach it to walk down the stairs. Mm -hmm. And in the long term, if that dog understands that it's got to walk up the stairs, instead of hurtle up and hurtle down, you are setting that dog up for longevity, a good mm -hmm. life, good quality of life, success. Mm -hmm. um, so that, I'm um, sorry, I got on my soapbox a little there, but it's things that we don't, I mean, as vets, we certainly don't talk about it. So environmental mm -hmm. control and control of movement is important in terms of excess movements. I mean, certainly no, no endurance. So no running on the road, no long walks, because even the long walks are going to pound those joints. Um, we rather work with the neurological development in puppies is huge until um, four, four to five months. So we mm. want to rather, and the skeleton is left behind. The skeleton mm. and the body is left behind. It's growing quickly, but it's, it, it, it can't cope. So in mm. up to four or five months of age, we should be focusing on mental stimulation, on socialization, on exposing those puppies to as much as they can within in a controlled way mm -hmm. and in there we should be doing what i call foundation exercises and those are body and hind limb awareness so mm -hmm. if you give your puppy or your puppy parents the ability to teach hind limb awareness and body awareness by six months of age mm -hmm. you will you will in my opinion seriously reduce the um the manifestation of these genetic mm -hmm. disorders mm -hmm. I like that. And and as you said, with the stairs, it's really just about not doing the things that are going to increase that risk so dramatically. Um, Charlotte is saying slippery floors. Yeah. I, these very funny videos that people like to share all over social media where the dogs are just slipping all over the place. I, I don't. How? How are we so blind? <laughs> but OK. Um, no soapboxing. Uh, you did, <laughs> you presented a webinar for us on this exact topic, the puppy development, didn't you? Yes. Yes. It's in I our did. membership. It's in our membership and it was fantastic. Um, and it goes through the neurological development and the exercises and everything is in there. So, um, I will link that as well when we're done. Um, and then if you guys are looking for a resource, very simple that you can share with owners to help educate them. We've created a puppy exercise guideline PDF from a vet rehabber's perspective, which really just highlights the different variables. So if this puppy is a large breed puppy and it's at an increased risk for hip dysplasia or elbow dysplasia, then avoid these things or do more of these things. Um, it will just help you educate owners and and give you a starting place to have a conversation from so every dog is an individual 
have that conversation, educate them and then have the, that conversation about what their dog needs and what their respect factors are. Um, and I'll share that with you as well because that one is free. So I'm going to cut us off here because we've hit 50 minutes. Guys, it's been so great to have you all live with us. Um, we have 56 people live with us right now, wow. which is pretty amazing. <laughs> really amazing. Thank you so much to everyone who is with us and supporting us. Tanya, thank you for sharing your knowledge um, and just be being willing to come online with me, have a conversation um, and chat with all of our bakery handlers. It's a great, it's a great pleasure. And thanks for all the questions and the responses and the comments. Um, I really thrive on all of this kind of interaction. So, yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. Have a great day, everyone. Yep.